So, I'll be talking about a subject which is slightly alien to some of you, probably quite a lot of you, so stop me if you want. If, if you don't understand anything, then do stop me. Right. So, how did I get here? As John just said, the reason I'm here is that I'm always giving our kid a good old ear bashing about computers, about things I've been doing, and th th this and that, and he usually sits there nodding and ignoring me. Right? But one day last year, I was rattling on to him about um, whatever it was to do with computers that I'd been doing, about machine languages, I think. And he said, his, ears, his little ears pricked up. And he said, oh, he said, would you come and talk about that at, at, at my conference next September? So here I am, you see. Um, I hope it's relevant. I hope you find it relevant. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to give a slightly different perspective on the term translation and, and, and what you, we understand by translation. But, um, if you don't understand, just do what John does and ignore me. <laughs> right. So, what this talk is, I hope to achieve two things. I want to put the concept of digital data into the, into the context of translation as you know it. And as a byproduct of this, I hope that some things may be slightly demystified in terms of these computer things that we, you know, that we have all around us. But if I make it more mystifying, I, I apologise. Um, what this talk is not, I'm hoping not to throw too many numbers and sums at you and to avoid as much as possible too much computer jargon. There are inevitably a few terms, expressions and conventions that I'll have to introduce to you as we go along, but I hope they won't bog us down too much. What I certainly do not want to do is to give an in-depth le in lecture on computer science. All I want to do is just to try and introduce a few concepts and attempt to put them into the context of translation as, as you know it. And hopefully it will shed some light on certain similarities and parallels between two seemingly very separate, separate subject areas. So not so much mass and formula, I hope. Right. So consider this function. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, forget that function. <laughs> right, so we'll talk about digital data and information, which is extremely commonplace in today's world. Right, what is digital data? Right, so the term we've got to introduce first of all is a byte. Now, I'm sure you've all, you're all familiar with the term byte, probably more as kilobytes, megabytes, or gigabytes, but um, it's important to the understanding of this subject that you understand what a byte is. So I'm just going to go over it quickly, right? Um, a byte is the axiomatic storage, unit of storage in a computer system. It's simply a variable numeric value which can sort any value between 0 and 255. Now, the reason it's 255 and not some nice round number like 100 or 1,000, is because computers count in base 2, see, in, in binary, as you may be aware. And that range, 0 to 255, are nice round numbers in, in binary. See, like, so it would be like 0 to 99 in, in, de in decimal, but it's 0 to 255. Right. So... Right, so I'm just going to I'm just going to touch on a quick aside, which is I'm just going to gloss over it in a few sentences. It's not it's not terribly important, but it needs to be mentioned, I think. Um, modern computers, like I just said, they do their counting in binary using binary digits zero and one to represent um, numbers and logical values, true and false. And the reason they do this is because um, of physical hardware. Um, in some contexts, zero and one can be represented by voltage levels, like zero volts and 3.3 .3 volts. Or in silicon um, solid state architecture, it can be which side of the band gap, very, very small band gap, the, the electrons jump to, you see. But having said that, it's not really important, okay? So we can, we can forget that. So, um, yeah, it doesn't matter that, it count in, but that computers count internally in binary because um, 
numbers essentially are numbers. You know, if, if you have 20 matches, right, if you have a quantity of 20 matches, however you describe that, whether you describe it in, in decimal, in base 10, as 2, 0, in binary, as 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, or in hexadecimal, say, as 1, 4, they're all 20, they all represent 20 objects, and that's what we're dealing with. So that's it about binary and stuff, because you don't really need to don't really need to concern yourself too much with that. Right, so, data and information in computer systems. Right, let's draw the distinction between data and information, right? Data, in a computing sense, is a string of numbers, zero or more numbers. Um, this data itself has no intrinsic meaning, but it can gain meaning by being given a context. In such a context, the data becomes information. Right, let's just have an example of data and information. Right, so if we look at the top sentence there. Hello, my name is Kwasliov. It, as English speakers, we can, we, we can say it, it, it stores and conveys information to us. Okay? Now, the next sentence down, which I'm not going to try and pronounce for you, um, doesn't really have any meaning, we don't think. But it's all, it's exactly the same letters, including spaces and punctuation, as the top one. So the data is kind of the same, other than the ordering. But it conveys no real information to us, you see. Um, now the context in which we glean information from the sentence is probably the most, um, Yeah, most meaningfully described as that of English language and understanding of social conventions, you see. Um, right, let's look at the top, that top sentence again. Right? Now, it seems to make sense in some useful way, given the framework of English language and grammar rules, etc. But we could take bits of the sentence on their own. For example, hello. And that would make sense, you could say that. My name. Again, it would make sense. It might not be terribly useful in isolation, but it makes sense. But what about the statement, Krasliov? What does it mean to us? Probably nothing. But with the context being preceded by, hello, my name is, um, it becomes clear that Krasliov is the name of something or someone so we can accept the word within the framework of the sentence in which we see it, even if it's not a word that we've seen before. Now, as I was saying the other day, um, Krasliov is actually a robot from Russia who's made out of recycled envelopes, uh, if, 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 that, if that's important to anyone. Right, so, so sum up, data has no meaning without a context, and when a context is given, the data then describes information. So, representing text on a computer system. So we've said that computerized data is, is a string or an ordered set of bytes, which are in turn nothing more than numbers. Now it's almost entirely true to say that storing and manipulating numbers is all that computers do. They don't really do anything else apart from chuck numbers around and crunch them. But when we use computers, I mean, I'm sure you, you all do, um, we often read, write, transmit character-based textual information, right? And like anything else in a computer, the text is stored as numbers, okay? So one of the simplest, oldest, and arguably most standard way of storing characters in text is the ASCII system, which stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It's a very old standard of, of um, encoding letters and, and characters, right? The premise of it is you define a one-to-one -one correspondence between the characters, that is, the Latin characters, numerals, zero to nine, and punctuation marks, formatting characters, etc. And a one-to-one -one correspondence with the numbers zero to 255, which we can represent with one byte, right? Um, so, for example, 
uppercase A, it, its code is 65, B is 66, all the way through the alphabet to Z is 90. And then the lowercase alphabet starts at 97, 98, all the way through to 122. And then you've got the zero character, which, which isn't the same as zero. It's not the same as the number zero in a computer, it's the character zero. And that is 48, one is 49, nine is um, up to nine is 57. And then you've got, um, you've got punctuation, comma, and space. I mean, it's important to note that space has its own character, and it needs to be there to, you know, to delimit the words. Right. So, and that's, that's the ASCII table. I won't say any more about that. <laughs> um, so, an example of ASCII and code. We, we, we look at our sentence, hello, my name is Krasliov. Right? It would be internally represented as this number sequence, you see? Now, again, this number sequence as just data doesn't really mean anything. It's just, it's just a load of numbers. Um, but as soon as you apply the, the ASCII character set to it, 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 it becomes that sentence, you know? It implies that sentence. So with the context of the ASCII character set, the above, the above um, sequence of numbers becomes a sentence in English. Right, now. So, data and, data and size. So when we store data, for example, a text document we've written, each character takes one byte in memory or on the hard disk of the computer. So clearly, hello, my name is Kwasliov, would take 27 bytes to store. That's 21 letters, two punctuation marks, and four spaces. If we wrote a whole page of text, of 2,500 characters, then it would take 2,500 bytes, or, in more common parlance, 2.5 kilobytes. Now, if John sits for six years and writes a 500,000 word thesis, which has two and a half million characters in it, then it's got, it takes up two and a half million bytes or two and a half megabytes, right? So there's clearly a linear relation between the amount of character data and the amount of storage required in a computer system. But what if we want to save space? Right, now, these are, I, I think most of you have heard of some of these. Zip, maybe, MP3, WMA, JPEG, MPEG. I I'm sure you've heard of some of those, right? Now, they would seem to be associated with various kind of file archives, music, pictures, videos on our computers, right? But what exactly are they? Why do we need more than one kind of music file, for example? Why do we need more than one kind of video file? Um, the short answer is that, that um, the different file types employ different types of encoding and, in particular, different types of data compression. Okay? Now, the subject of data compression is a big, big subject, and it draws on some quite mathematical concepts. Um, but I'm going to outline the, the general techniques because, they, they, in essence, they're fairly simple. So, uh, and it's, it's actually a very big subject, a very big research area in computing. So, um, so compression of written text. We'll, we'll talk about the compression of written text first. Okay. So we've looked at how text is represented on a computer system, how it's a string of, of bytes that relate to characters. Um, but we asked the question, can we use it storing less data? Or perhaps more technically, can we store our text using significantly fewer bytes than there are characters in the text? And the short answer to it is often yes, you can. And we'll look at a few examples of how it, how it might be done. So, run length encoding. Look at that sentence. It's got 20 A's followed by 30 B's, right? So, in memory, it would take 50 bytes of data, okay? Now, given the structure of the data, all we need to store is 
A, and the number of times it occurs, and then B, and the number of times it occurs, which only takes a very small amount of data, just a few bytes, you see. So we've compressed it quite considerably. Um, and this is called, this kind of compression is called run length encoding, right? Now, clearly in, in some situations, run length encoding can be used to save data. But how likely is it when you're writing that, that you have the same letter repeated 20 times? It, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's not really. You, you might have a, a string of full stops or a string of spaces, but it's, it's not that often. So in practical terms, run length encoding isn't that useful for, for compressing um, text data. All right? Although it does have its uses, um, binary, binary bitmap images, for example, but it, generally it's not that useful in practice. But a much better compression of written text can usually be achieved with a family of techniques called dictionary compression algorithms. Now, ZIP, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, uses dictionary, um, it uses a technique called adaptive dictionary techniques. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that now. So let's look at this verse of this children's nursery rhyme. You can sing it if you want. Um, <laughs> ten green bottles hanging on the wall, ten green bottles hanging on the wall. If one green bottle should accidentally fall, there'd be nine green bottles hanging on the wall. Okay, now this is, mm, I'll tell you in a minute. This is 175 characters. Okay, so it's uncompressed form. It would take 175 bytes to store. But if we look at it, we can spot repeating strings. See here? Take it from there. Green bottles hanging on the wall occurs three times. Yeah? So what we do, we take, we take this string that repeats. So we define the entry in the dictionary. Green bottles hanging on the wall, and we give that the label one. And then whenever that text appears, we substitute one. So the rhyme now becomes 10, one, 10, one. And if one green bottle should accidentally fall, there'd be nine, one. It's not quite as catchy as the original. <laughs> <laughs> you can... I think it's a significant difference. Do you? Well, <laughs> well it's all right. But, but you can see how we're, we're taking this, defining it, and saying, you know, and, and there are a lot of re repeated, these sorts of repeated patterns in, in language, you know, words and stuff. Okay. What? Words and stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, words are defined. They're defined strings. And they pop up a lot. Yeah, words and stuff. Right, so let's, let's go a bit further into this, right? Um, so if we, look, um, if we look back at the, um, the what's it see, right? Now, what have we got? So green bottles... Because there, 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 green bottle that is. Now, and, and if we, and when we've got, if we chop that, that off, so we've got S hanging on the wall, right? So, if we define green bottle to be label one, and then we've got S hanging on the wall as label two, and then we have a nested dictionary entry, so that's 10, one, two, which becomes 10, um, which becomes 10 green bottles hanging on the wall, if you expand that out, right? And then we can compress the verse to three, three, and if one, one should accidentally fall, there'd be nine, one, two. <laughs> now that's all right, isn't it? That's a bit better. Um, yeah, it's quite catchy. But you see how we've... We've, we've, we've really reduced the size, that, and, and if you had a, a lot of... I mean, if you had the, all ten verses of it, you could, you could squeeze it right up. So, um, that, so that's the basic concept of um, compression. Now, so, so far we've been looking at compression of written text. Um, after we've compressed the data, we decompress it at any time, and it will faithfully reproduce the original text as it was, before we compressed it. So we can therefore throw away the original text and just keep the compressed one because we know that at any time 
we want it, we can decompress it, and there's our, there's our text again, you see? So we don't have to keep it, we can save space on our computer. Now, what if, what if I said I could make it even smaller? Um, sounds good, yeah, but, but what if I then said that when you decompress it, the resultant text wasn't quite the same as the original, it might have a few bits of sentence missing or a few characters might be wrong. Uh, it's not useful, is it, in that, in that context? Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. How does, is there a marker as to how it knows where to come back? Yeah, I mean, you, you have this, this you mean? Do you mean this? No. Eh? That it's got to come back in the original place. Ah, uh, well, you, you, have, you have a header, basically a header which defines this dictionary at the top of the file. And then you have, what often happens is you have text, and you have what's called an escape character. So as soon as it sees this escape character, which might be zero or something, then it knows it's looking at a reference from the dictionary. So as soon as it sees that escape character, then it will look at the next number and pull that reference out of the dictionary and off it will go again. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so the dictionary itself takes space? Yes. I mean, you have to, you have to define these things once. I mean, you have to have the term um, green bottle, for example, you see. So it will exist once, but the point is it only exists once and then it only takes a single reference so if, to point to it. If, if any word occurs twice or more in a text, you may as well have a dictionary reference for it, as long as yeah. the word's long enough to make yeah. the reference shorter. Yeah, if it was a two-character two, two word, yeah. then you'd, you'd have to use an escape character and a reference to get it, so you'd be using two bytes instead of two bytes. So a two-letter word that occurred in the text twice, you wouldn't compress? No. A two-letter word that occurred in the text No, text, no. Yeah, you, you need two characters every time you refer to it, you see. So instead of having a two-byte word, you've got two bytes of something else, which isn't... It's no advantage. But you could put that word as part of the phrase. Yeah. There is an, an octopus. A phrase would be... Yeah, exactly. I mean, you might have... Yeah, an, an space octopus might occur a lot of times. So it might pick that up, put it in its dictionary, and, you know, you'd have your octopus... So in this particular dictionary, text. you might find... Octopus is one reference, and octopus is another. Well, if octopus is reference, yeah, two, you'd, for instance, you'd, you'd nest, you'd find nest it. And two is another reference. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. You'd nest yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like like this. Yeah. So ten one two is ten green bottles hanging on the wall. But you can you, you know you, you you're even saving space in your dictionary in your in your header. Yes. That's true. The yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't necessarily do that, but if you wanted to email or, or send the whole Bible to Australia over the internet, it might the time and effort to compress it and then decompress it might, you know, um, save bandwidth. But yeah, that that is. There's no such thing as free lunch. There's no such thing as no. There's always a there's always a trade-off. Decompression is much much faster than compression because creating these um, dictionaries it can be computationally quite expensive and take a lot of processor power in your computer. But yeah, th there is a trade-off with speed and efficiency. Right. Um, so yeah, so. Right, so lo that's lossless compression, where you can reconstruct the original faithfully. Um, lossy compression um, is when you don't actually reconstruct the original data. And it might sound a bit silly, but the um, when when you use um, when you use lossy compression, the techniques employed um, they prey on some. It, it's usually some what's known as psychological compression, 
And what they do is they take some, some fact about what, what information we need out of, out of what the total information and, and throw away anything that basically get rid of stuff if people doesn't notice, right? Now, that, that is to say if, if you had audio data, you, you, you throw away the bits that can't hear and you end up with much less. But what, in your context of audio data, it still sounds much the same, right? We'll, we'll come back to that anyway. Um, um, so, I'm just going to talk about computerized images now. Um, the most common way of digitizing an image is known as rasterization, um, and the re resulting image is known as a raster graphics or bitmap image. And the principle is that the image is represented by a dot matrix structure representing a rectangular grid of pixels or colored dots. Now, within the computer memory, or, or on the disk as a file, each pixel or dot is represented by a number of bytes. Um, a very common color space is known as the 24-bit RGB color space, which simply means that each pixel is represented by three bytes. And the way it works, if you're interested, is um, the first byte represents the intensity of red, the second byte, the intensity of green, and the third byte, the intensity of blue. So it's like mixing different amounts of the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. So, for example, if we had an image that's 200 by 300 pixels, then you end up with 60,000 pixels. Now, for each pixel, it takes three bytes of data to storage. So 60,000 times three is 180,000 bytes, or 180K. Right, now. I'm now going to talk about a process to reduce the amount of data to store an image. Now, it's not strictly speaking usually a compression algorithm, but it will give, it, it's a nice easy way to introduce sort of the processes involved and what they imply. Right. So, that's a real bottle of lentils. That is. Now, in a real kitchen, that's my kitchen. That's my teapot with a dog on it. Right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to come over here. Right. So here's, here's, right, down here, can you see that all right? Yeah. Down here we've got four files, okay? Now we're looking at the one on the, on the right here, and it's 36 and a half megabytes. And they, these are raw images, they're not compressed in any way. So the amount of data you're looking at is the actual amount of image data, okay? So this one's 36 and a half megabytes, which is pretty massive. This one here, which looks the same, is 2.2 um, megabytes, which is not that big. This one here is 1.18 megabytes. And this one here is less than a megabyte. So it's, it's considerably, it's less than 40 times smaller than that one. Now, if you look at them, they really all look the same, right? So you could ask the question, why would I keep this big one when this little one looks the same? And what I'm going to do to illustrate this fact is I'm going to show you some lentils. <laughs> so if we, if we zoom in on these lentils, OK, and you can see you can see each lentil. Can you see that all right? Yeah. You can see each lentil there, and, that, and you can see the barcode there. And it's all very clear. And we're zooming right in. And they look like lentils. See, we've gone right in. And I, I took that just with my camera the other day. And you can, see the, you can see the shape of all the lentils, right? So we've zoomed right in, OK? Now, if we look at this one, which is very, very small, OK? So, again, it, look, it looks the same. There's no real noticeable difference, is there? But when we zoom in, you see the barcode? It's not, you can't see anything. And coming on these lentils, 
Well, there aren't any lentils. It's just a, it's an orange mess. So, that is why when we're zoomed right out, they look the same. But when we zoom in, we've lost, we've thrown away a lot of image data. And we did that by reducing the number of pixels used by that and by that. And this one is 15%. So it's 15% it's of, of the size each way as this big one, you see. And so you can see that we've thrown away a lot of the data. And if it's just this overall image that we want, then it's fine. But otherwise, we, we, need to, we need to keep the data. So the context is, in this case, how much, um, how, much how closely do we want to zoom? And, and that dictates how much information we can throw away, you see. So there's the context. The context is how far you want to zoom. Oh, no, that's right. Um, there's various, like I said, that's not really compression, but it's, it re reduces the size. There's various lossless and psychological lossy image compression algorithms like JPEG and GIF, but I won't talk about them now. Right, I'm going to talk about optical character recognition. Um, now, optical character recognition, or OCR, is the process of turning a raster image into text. <coughs> and I, I describe it as being analogous to the process of reading as human beings, like I stand and look at that sheet, and, and I make characters out of it. The computer does the same thing. OK? So um, here's, here's, here's the G. And that's an actual character from the text. And you can see these grid lines. Each one of those is a pixel. And you see, see around like that? And you see how it's made up of dots. And it is, I tell you, it's 125 by 135 pixels, this. So um, times three bytes, it's about 50 kilobytes of, of raw image data, that. Um, but we know that we can encode the letter G with one single byte as ASCII text, you see. So, if we, had, if we had a whole scanned page of text containing, say, 3,000 characters, it, it would be several megabytes. I mean, it, it depends, but it would be several megabytes generally, or several million bytes, okay? But if, if we OCR it, and extract the text from it, then the 3,000 characters, as we, as we talked about earlier, will take 3,000 bytes, which is three kilobytes, which is several thousand times smaller in terms of data size. Right? Um, so we've done a translation. We've, we, we've done a translation from this bitmap image, which takes a lot of data, and we've converted it to text data, which takes a lot, 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 lot less, right? But we've only done this within the context of assuming that the text data is all we want, you see. There's, there's more information on, on the original piece of paper that we scanned. But if we throw away that picture, and delete it, throw it away, um, and we keep just the text, then we've discarded a lot of potential information, you see. So, we may want to look at, uh, later on, um, what font it was, whether it was done with a typewriter or a computer or handwritten. We might be interested in a coffee stain in the corner. I, I don't know. There's, but there's a whole host of information that, as soon as we turn it to text format, raw text, it's all gone. All we've got is the text. So, so that's, that's a translation, and it's a lossy translation. Um, and it, the, the context there assumes that all we want is the text, you see. Um, so, yeah. Now, I'm just going to talk very briefly about CD um, and MP3 compression. Um, so, digitized data, I won't, obviously, it's, 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 it's audio data represented by numbers. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the implementation or how sound is represented in a computer system by numbers. But 
Well, I'll say, I'll say this. It, it's, it's roughly true that CD quality on the CD player is better than any human being could tell. It, you know, um, they, they couldn't tell the difference from the original, right? But it takes a lot of data. It's about 10 megabytes per minute, actually. Um, now, MP3 employs this com concept. You've, you've all heard of MP3, haven't you? And it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's an audio data compression algorithm. And what it does, it uses this concept of frequency masking, which is the idea that a lower frequency masks to the, to the ear the higher frequency. So basically what you have to do is you have to take away... You, if you look, analyse it and find out all the things that people can't hear, then you can take that information and throw it away and just keep what people can hear. See? Now, the way it's done is it, there's a psychoacoustic model of the ear, which is a mathematical model of the inner ear, and they literally play the music through this model, see what comes out the other end, and they kind of keep those frequencies and get rid of everything else, and that's, that's how it works. And you get... Typically, MP3 is about 10%, depending on the bit rate, but it's about 10% of the original. So the amount of data it takes up is 10%. It, so you've thrown away 90% of the audio information. Now, the resulting audio information is often very different. The waveform is very different from the original. But, to most people, it sounds the same. So within the context of people's hearing, you've extracted the information that you want. Can you tell us what it is you've thrown away? Well, it's, yes, it's, um, if you imagine a waveform, I mean, you know. Sound. A, sound. Yeah, a sound wave, and it, 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 it's digitised like that. Now, if, it, if, it's, if it's changing very rapidly, you have to sample it at a very high frequency. So you have to take a sample. CD audio takes one sample of, of, of the sound and converts it to a number. Um, 44.1 thousand times a second, right? But if it's a bit, I mean, if it's a bit of silence between tracks, there's no point having a very, very um, high frequency, lots of data to store silence. So basically, you reduce the, you reduce the bit rate, you reduce the quality of that because you don't need as high frequencies. So you throw away frequency information about the higher frequencies, which are masked by the lower frequencies. Does that make sense? I suppose by analogy, when people blow a dog whistle, dogs can hear it. Yeah. If humans can't. Yeah. So if you had, if you had a, a recording of a Beethoven symphony, you might get your computer to find all of the frequencies of the dog whistle type within that recording, yeah. and you'd throw them away, because yeah. the human would never hear them anyway. Yeah, because the human, you can't hear a dog whistle, so you don't need to keep the information about it. Um, I believe I believe a dog whistle would would be would be um, reproduced by a CD, and you play a, you play a dog whistle CD and you, you, your dog will go nuts, but you couldn't hear anything. But in terms of data, you don't need to keep it. In terms of our hearing, but if you made an MP3 of a dog whistle, the dog might not be able to hear it because you might have taken away the dog whistle. Do you see? Is that okay? Ish. Ish. <laughs> All right. Um, Space. You've thrown away the data, um, but it's data that you couldn't hear anyway. It's, it, it's data pertaining to information that you couldn't hear. Oh, the space is still there, but you don't need to store very high, very um, high definition information about silence. All you've got to do is say to the player, "Play me two seconds of silence," which is just a code which takes a few bytes, and then you save two seconds of data. You don't need to keep it. Does that? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Does that mean, so you arguing that that doesn't change the hearing experience at all? Uh, no, it. It's MP3. Some people with very good hearing don't like MP3. I, I believe. Um, Alex. Yeah. Because if you, yeah, if you've got very sharp hearing, 
then, um, then some people don't like it because they, they can hear the bits that are missing or they can't hear the bits that are missing and they could hear the bits that are missing. Um, but people with average hearing, and I, when I say average, it's going to be sort of 95% of people's hearing. So the top 5% you have to go and buy the CD, but everyone else can download it as an MP3. Do, do, do you see? It's all to do with the type of music too. So orchestral music doesn't work great on MP3s because you have this wide range yeah. of um, frequencies yeah. that you're going from very, very low to yeah. just that you need to pick up to very, very high. And when it's compressed, you lose kind of bits around the edge. Yeah. But for most, say, pop music, the range in your kind of is, is quite small, it's quite medium, so compressing it, you don't lose stuff around the edges. It's the, yeah. it's the stuff yeah. around the edges. So then again, it's, it's context dependent. Yeah. And, and it's for some kinds of music, in some context of music, MP3 isn't good. Yeah. But for others, it, and for other people, it, for people, it is. Yeah. Most people won't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I can normally. Yeah. And if you're playing, even if you're playing orchestral music on an MP3 player, with uh, headphones that aren't very good and that don't pick up a wide range of frequencies anyway. So it's pointless to yeah. have a big file in your MP3 player that's converted in your ears anyway. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so we are, that's, that's about it. We, we, we use digital information, to, digital data to store all sorts of information and we often make it undergo translation in terms of a certain context to reduce the size or whatever. Um, and we, we can sometimes extract specific contextual data and remove extraneous data that we don't want. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope, I hope it was um, more, more than... It's quite exciting for most of us to get some insight into it because these terms are mystifying to many of us. <laughs> Clearly not all, but... <laughs> well, I was, I was just going to say thank you because I think actually some of the terms that you use can be, could be quite useful <laughs> for our discussion, differences between data and information. And um, I'm a little worried that all my translations are lossy translations, <laughs> though, now. And <laughs> well, they <laughs> but, yeah, within, I hope so. Within the context of a translator... <laughs> yeah. You have to uh, throw away or at least change information. Yeah, yeah. and, and in, in context that might be fine, isn't it? That's, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's what I take from it. It depends whether that's good or bad translation, mm -hmm. lossy translation. Yeah. Yeah. It um, depends, it depends it on in which, what you need it for, the yeah. translation. And I think that's what's interesting about the MP3 discussion and the, and the headphones <coughs> thing. So my husband is a total nerd about music and audio files, works in pro audio. Um, so he's very specific about what sort of file he wants because he knows what sort of amp he's putting it through and what sort of speakers it's coming through. But he will say, there's no point having a massive music file on your MP3 because like yeah. that's it. It's going through a tiny, it's like, and it's like translating a very complicated text into something into a language with very small vocab. Yeah. You've got to make some decisions about yeah. what you keep and don't keep because yeah. actually you can't just transfer it straight away. So it's, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> John, I'm thinking that there are all sorts of points of contact between what we've been talking about and actually the kind of thing which most of us spend our time doing. But one which struck me particularly when you were showing us your lentils um, is that there are a slightly number of people nowadays who stare at high definition reproductions of parchments and yes. such like on the web um, with a view to actually researching the original copies of the text and such like the implications. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, a, a conversation I had with some Islamic scholars some years ago at, at a conference, and uh, there were amongst them were some calligraphers, and they were speaking of Quran and they reproduced Quran. They were talking about the way you draw a stroke in Islamic calligraphy mm -hmm. and how that makes a difference when you actually read. It. And those of us that don't read classical Arabic were sat there thinking, what? <coughs> Um, but they were absolutely adamant that there are ways in which that stroke is placed on the paper, which makes a difference to sort of how you interpret that clip. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? They were alleging this. I'm not, not entirely sure, sure I was convinced, but they were absolutely adamant. But that's the kind of thing which, which you begin to, to lose when you start. Yeah.
Yeah. Which is a loss of compression. That's, that's right. Yeah, you have to use very high. You know, you talked about the coffee stain. One man's coffee stain is another man's um, hidden text underneath. Yes. Yeah. Right. The, the, there's just a huge amount of contingent contextual information on the surface of the leather of Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. And on the back. Oh, the mud on the back. They keep photographing the fronts of them, and they never photograph the back. And, and people who, I mean, people like Staden and Emil Puesh, who spent years with the scrolls, they were adamant that all of this extra information, apart from the text, and also simply indications of, well, I mean, if you just preserve the text, you don't preserve the handwriting of Scribe A intruding into the text of scribe B and that kind of thing, you've just got the text. So you get, I mean, from, from the manuscripts themselves, you discover collaborations between sometimes three different scribes on one manuscript and one scribe correcting another's work and making alterations in margins. <coughs> uh, and there was, there was a case that Stegemann always used to tell me about, which is rather tragic. Um, the, the fragments used to come in stacks stuck together because the scrolls were rolled up, they lay in caves, most of the scroll would decompose and you'd end up with a stack of fragments stuck together representing successive revolutions of, of a roll. <laughs> they then get separated. Um, people spent lots of time photographing the fronts and reading the text from the front. Uh, for example, the Job Targum, you just get these circles and we don't know what the rest of the text said. Uh, Stegemann was aware that quite a lot of text was imprinted backwards on the back of lots of these fragments. And he was, he'd been planning for years to go back to Jerusalem and transcribe it all. But then the technicians in the laboratory washed the backs mm. and stuck, <laughs> stuck them to muslin. And he told me that uh, it had gone and that was that. <laughs> Were you going to say something? I'll just, well, I'll say that, uh, level, they're now doing face recognition software for manuscripts. So trying to identify manuscripts from the same family or the same scribe uh, using uh, face recognition, because you can do the colour, the texture uh, of, this, of the parchment itself, plus then also the handwriting, um, which then means actually if you do a compressed file, you lose yeah. that differentiation. Yeah. And there was also quite interesting so far. Yeah. Uh, where we've got thousands of manuscripts in different libraries, it's able to at least do a quick preliminary search and identify the areas in the literature. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> this is where, yes, a lot because of the size of an image of a manuscript, because of the colours and stuff, yeah. people do like to compress them. Yeah, well, yeah, but you should, I mean, you can compress them, but you want anything like that that's important, you want to use lossless compression. Keep all the image data that you possibly can. That's right. Yeah. So there seem to be analogies to translating, particularly the application of context. Yes. Yeah. And then there seem to be, in fact, practical implications for scanning scrolls. Uh, yeah. As well. Which is yeah. A different I mean, that, that is. Yeah. That, that's not. That wasn't my main point. My main point was the, the translation of data within context. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it is important. Um, yeah. Anyone else? All done? I was going to say, to say about lossless translation or lossless, lossless compression. People have tried it to yeah. translate from one language to another and then back again. Mm -hmm. And it never works, really. No. Although we do it when we when we go to Google Translate or Powerful Fish or whatever all these others, we actually expect a kind of lossless translation yeah. through machine translation. Well, there's probably no such <laughs> thing as lossless kind of translation between any two languages, really, is there? I mean, not at least not changeless. There's not lossless. lossless there's no. not lossless transmission between two statements in the same language. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, the whole idea of lossless when it comes to, to that sort of communication seems to me um, idealistic in the extreme. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. you lose form to begin with immediately. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, with computer data, you can have lossless. You know, yeah. you can yeah. transmit it from one place to the other and verify that it's the same. Um, well, I suppose that's slightly different. That's why the analogy of context is yeah. quite illuminating. Yeah, that's, that's right. The context 
determines what the information is and what it means, what it signifies to you. Yeah. What you want and how you're using the thing. That's, That's right. the context. Yeah. The data is just the data. Yes. And that is not really an analogous to translation of human languages. But no. information, information becomes analogous. And, uh, yeah, the, but the difference is that the, the alphabet <coughs> is using to store it is just numeric. Yeah. I want to sort of try a mind game thing. If you go back to your jar of lentils mm. in the compressed form, yes. could you also have a trigger with it so that the computer would be aware when you were zooming in and actually substitute another picture of lentils so that you think you're seeing with greater clarity. Um, what might be the implications of this? Yes. Linguistic you, translation. You could, you could have a model. Um, you, with that sort of thing, if, if it's a raster image, then it's, it's at a certain you know, level of... Um, but what actually happens in, on, on, on the internet is sometimes you have an image at, on the server and you click on it and it, it sends you a bit of it, you see. So, because on the internet, the networks, the, the bandwidth is important, you know, the, the speed it comes in at. So if you're just zoomed in on that, it will only send you that bit, you see. So yes, but there are other ways of doing it. Um, there's vector graphics, which instead of just storing all the information about lots and lots of dots, stores information about curves and it uses mathematical curves to store this information and, and so when, when you zoom in it just recalculates all the pixels from the model within it, you see. And, like Google Maps though, wouldn't it? Um, you zoom in at Google Maps, you see like Yeah, well that, that's a, that's slightly different again, that, that's, that is a model. Um, yeah. It's a model of a map which, which then renders to, to a, yeah, that's right. But uh, I don't know if you've heard of SVG, um, Scalable Vector Graphics. If you, if you zoom in, you can keep zooming in and keep zooming in. And I believe that's what's used in um, um, fonts. Because you know if you, you, you have a font at size 12, or you could have a font at size 100. It doesn't have all those different pictures. It has, it has the, the, the model of the, the lines around the, um, the font. And so at any resolution, it just re-renders it and works out the dots on the screen at that particular time. So, yeah. Might that work for manuscripts where you want, you know, sometimes want the detail and sometimes not. But you'd have to model it generally, but on any manuscript you're interested in specifically, what was there? A scan of something is, is always a rasterized image because that's, that's, how, that's how you take... Um, that's how you take the picture with a camera or a scanner. Um, you would have to build it from those dots into a, um, a vector image if you wanted to do that. Yes. But there are ways you can use vectors linguistically speaking. Um, if, 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 you look, if we start thinking of this in terms of linguistic structures, the vector is a structure, basically. It's a way of describing the structure. And any document, any text document, is full of structures. And if you can identify those structures, one of the ways in fact you can identify and describe them is by storing these vectors. And there are a number of different ways of doing this. The last bit is if they very early stages, but there are, are applications for this kind of descriptive technology in terms of what happens inside texts as well. And, and they, are, they are recoverable, they are round trippable. Yeah. We're talking about loss in loss first. If it's a critical thing, if the data is really, really important to you, is can I round trip it? Yeah. Can I transform it from this representation into that representation and back to this one and it's exactly the same as it was before. If you can do that, it doesn't matter how much impression or what, what's happening in the transformation, if it will round trip, it's okay. Yeah. That's the critical thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right.